afternoon. I just wanted to say welcome to everybody um, and introduce our panel. Um, it's, it's a little bit awkward to organize, but we will try to have speeches in between the various dishes and so on. But, uh, but um, uh, we're here to talk about the ocean. Um, the, 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 the incredible thing about the ocean, in a sense, is that um, it connects us all on every continent, so we all play a part. So the pollution or the plastic that comes out of the beaches here may have an effect in Rio de Janeiro, or the agricultural runoff from Canada may affect Chile. Um, so it's a very, it calls for a um, globalized um, response. Um, um, it, it, it's the world's largest ecosystem um, and, and also the world's largest source of oxygen. It's under threat from overfishing, pollution, um, and climate change, which is heating the, the sea in, not the same, but in, in, in alarming ways like, like our air. Um, and the key questions are how, how can we start to address this? We always, we've always thought about, um, the environmental damage on, on land, but it is perhaps only beginning, starting that we're thinking about the sea. Uh, and as more research is done into the damages that have done to the sea over time, perhaps it'll become obvious that we need to spend as much, if not more, to save the ocean. Um, and the key question within that is, is, is how you can get international solutions. Uh, and how do we want, or what do we want, a future blue economy to look like? So, um, after you finish your soup, we will, uh, we, <laughs> we, 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 we have um, the Honourable, Honourable Bernard Essau, who's the, ministry, uh, who's the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources from Namibia, who will be our first speaker, and he will tell us about his point of view. And then we have a number of other people. Uh, we have um, the head of Portugal's Marine and Meteorological Institute who will speak. And then we have a number of people who look at specific elements. One who, is a, who is a, has a technological solution to, to how to make um, environmentally friendly concrete, who is Shimrit from, from, from Israel. And we have Toshin Thiele, who, is, um, who looks at how to finance uh, ways of, of, of making the sea, ocean, the sea cleaner. And we have Paul Bakken, who is the, the founder of, a, um, of an NGO who is looking to, or who is aiming to, to restore seaweed forests in the ocean. Um, so just eat your soup, and then we'll soon hear what, uh, what the minister has to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director, Moderator. Uh, let me say all protocol observed. Uh, having said that, uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting Namibia to participate and also to share our experiences in the context of our oceans. As we all know, 70% of the globe is oceans. 30% is from its land surface. And we need to take care of our oceans at all costs. We know that our oceans is under threat, uh, threats of overfishing, we have threats that we are experiencing of pollution, as it was highlighted here, and we are also under threat when it comes to climate change. Overfishing, we need to ensure that we sustainably manage the resources of our ocean in order to avoid overfishing. Now, in our experience as Namibia, we have the supreme law of our country. And within the supreme law provision is made, 
to protect our natural resources. It is a constitutional requirement in the Namibian context. Now, to give meaning, to give material meaning to that provision of the constitution, we have the Marine Resources Act that was passed by our parliament. And in that very act, it is required whenever we fish, we need to carry out assessment on an annual basis. And we do that very religiously. We, in fact, have made budgetary provision within our meager means as Namibia, as a small country, at least to send out our research vessels to do surveys and to assess, to determine the biomasses, to determine all the other factors that influence the fisheries that we want to harvest. Uh, maybe somebody don't know where Namibia is located. Maybe I should come back. Some know, everybody knows I know, on the southwestern coast of Africa. Uh, yes, I want just to clear that one. Uh, we have um, we have an EEZ uh, area surface covering around about 540,000 square kilometers. It's quite big. The coastline is 1,572 kilometers long. And the EEZ worthwhile is 200 nautical miles. And we are trying to see maybe we can get more space, at least to exercise controls on that. Now, coming back to overfishing, as I have stated, we determine our total allowable catches on a sound scientific basis. So the, the data that we are deriving from this exercise of surveys is scientific. We also collaborate with the Fritz of Nansen, this Norwegian uh, research vessel. Uh, uh, they are always coming as well as benchmarking our, 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 our scientific activities that we are carrying out on the marine side. Still on overfishing, what we are having in place is the monitoring, control, and surveillance activities. Namibia has invested very heavily into these very activities. That is when it comes to monitor, control, and surveillance. We have invested in hardware that's in planes. We have invested in vessels. We have invested in the vessel monitoring systems, VMSs. And we are now looking at entering into a MOU with the Global Fish Watch. So we want at least that to happen before the World Oceans Day, June 8, if possible. But we are working towards that deadline to achieve that and to sign the MOU and try to see how we can contribute towards a healthy ocean. Towards a healthy ocean through, through, the, through MSC activities. Uh, further, we have also structures in place when it comes to MSCs. We have a fisheries observer agency. Uh, it's an agency that is helping us in monitoring all the activities on sea. We have observers on each and every fishing vessel. In control with our land-based uh, centers, uh, uh, but we are still, there's still scope for improvement on that one. Uh, now, this is what we are doing in Namibia in terms, very briefly, when it comes to overfishing issues, which is a threat 
to our oceans. And we want that also to be emulated by other member states who are in, involved in fishing. The other threat that we are faced with is the threat of ocean pollution. Um, we said by 2015, as predicted, as calculated, that we will have more plastics in our seas than fish. So that's a very serious situation. Uh, plastic waste needs urgent attention. That's globally. We need global action on this, especially the nanoplastics. It's a threat to us, and we need to do something on that. And I know that as Namibia, through our line ministry of environment and tourism, they are also addressing the plastic challenge that is faced globally. The dumping of toxic waste is also one of the challenges, a threat towards our oceans, which we are not in support neither nuclear waste in our oceans, because those need also attention, and that is part of the threats towards our ocean pollution. The other issue which I have maybe skipped, which I wanted to talk, <clears throat> under overfishing is IUU. The illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing activities within our EEZ states. Um, we've been experiencing this in our countries, and we are not supporting these activities. Because IUU fishing threat is promoted by harmful fishing subsidies for shipbuilding and repairs of fishing vessels. This is one of the issues which we don't support, and we are very aware of the fact that the WTO is interrogating this matter of harmful fishing subsidies. Uh, we are in support that this must be eliminated, that the subsidies, especially is harming our developing countries. Uh, um, you have oversupply, overcapacity of fishing vessels, and that those vessels are ending up in our EEZs. And what happens, it disturbs our TACs, the total allowable catches. Then IUU is coming in place. The, the last issue as is a threat which I want also to highlight, which was highlighted by the, by the moderator, is climate change. We know that there's a rising temperature, sea temperatures that we're experiencing. I know that we are also experiencing oceans acidification that is caused by the CO2 levels, high CO2 levels. Uh, and this very situations are threats to our coral reefs, the small countries as well, as well as our ex exoskeleton fishery species. We talk about lobster, because when the assets are high, then you know what happens to that. The deep sea crab, those are really under threat because of the high levels of acidity acidification of the oceans. Actions. What needs to be done? We are strongly in support for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. That must happen to address these very issues. The way forward the way forward is we need to have a sustainable oceans, a blue oceans economy in place. Not only nationally, but also globally. And it must be sustainable from an ecosystem's point of view as well. 
It must be sustainable. You should have proper, prom, uh, I mean, proper management systems in place for a sustainable oceans uh, system. You need to make sure that your MSY levels, the maximum sustainable yield levels, are adhered to. It is very important for us. If you are outside your MSY levels, then you start overfishing. You again disturb the equation of us as human beings, the ocean, and the land. We need to see to it that our oceans are not becoming ascetic. They should not be warming up. Neither do we need to see dead, dead oceans where we don't have oxygen. Secondly, in terms of the blue economy, uh, we want to see a sustainable socioeconomic situation whereby at least those, those members who are not benefiting from the ocean are also included in participating in the resources of the ocean. So equitable distribution of ocean resources. And lastly, we want to see that there is investments in our ocean. Sustainable investments uh, whereby we unlock the potential, as I've said, that the surface of the ocean is about nearly 70% of, of the globe. And there is still a lot that we can do in terms of tourism, mining, you talk about renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. I believe that when we discuss, we can still interrogate for some of the points we can. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Okay. I know you are waiting to continue your meal, so I will try to be very, I will say, efficient on the message I would like to convey to you. I think that the general idea was already, was already presented by the Minister for Fisheries of Namibia, but I would also like to say to you my point of view. I'm a geophysicist, I'm a professor of geophysics, and uh, first of all, I need to be clear with you. Nobody really knows how the ocean appears in the Earth. There are competing theories, some of them from the outer space, others from the inner Earth, others from the initial composition of the nebula. Nobody knows how it was built initially, so nobody knows how it can be kept on the long run. There will never be two ocean. There is no plan B for the ocean. And initially, the ocean was the first global feature that appears on Earth, because there is, a sing there is only a single ocean. And by the way, there is only a single deep current on the ocean. But during our history, we put names on different basins, and we put names on different pieces of the ocean, and we gave the countries the authority to manage those small areas of the ocean. So we created the fragmentation of something that God, or physics, because you know, I think that physics is the God, puts on Earth the single ocean that sh is a, should be I will say, the property of the whole humanity. So we started by the wrong point, and we made what I can call a fragmented regional 
and selfish management of the ocean. That's why we were so stupid that we put on the ocean radioactive waste, like was described before. We were so stupid that we considered that the fishing capacity was infinite. And we were so stupid that we were able to conceive laws for the coastal areas. That's where most of the economy has been in the last centuries, but we didn't matter too much on the deep ocean that we thought it was terra incognita. Nobody no wants to know, nobody wants to pay for nothing there. Things changed during the second half of the 20th century, and things changed when the first global catastrophes stroke the media in the whole earth. Even catastrophes like Chernobyl, or catastrophes like the Sumatra tsunami, or catastrophes like, I would say, for example, now, the hurricane in Mozambique. These are global catastrophes that everyone understands that they are connected to the planet and where the borders are meaningless. The idea that a single government is able to manage such kind of phenomenon is wrong. It will never be the reality. So this is, should be the best starting point to say, let's discuss how to do global governance of the oceans. Because in principle, it should be one of the easiest problems compared, for example, with global governance of commerce, of trading, sorry, or global uh, governance of defense. The ocean should be easy. There is not so much economy there. There is some economy, of course, but not so much. But what happens is that when we act uh, regionally or nationally, we are selfish, but no one has a clue how to do global governance of nothing. And I'm talking not as a representative of my minister, that should be my place here, but as uh, an individual that listens to, to, to the newspapers, reads the newspapers, listens to the TV, and understands that we were up to now, we are unable to understand how this global government can be done. We have good ideas, and we understand that cooperation should be one of those ideas. But sometimes, you know, that we mislead our dreams to the reality. And I, I am never sure if we are leading to a, the globalization of our life or if, if we are only going upscale, if we are only changing scale. And I have also, while, while I am the president of the of the Portuguese Meteorological Institute. I'm also the president of the European Center for Meteorology uh, that is in the UK. And in these Brexit times, it's very hard to understand how people can be so stupid in all, in all positions, in all positions, how people cannot understand that going to a larger scale is a different business and it is a different world. I do not know if we are, or we are already in this global step or if we are only in a continental scale step. And my vision, frankly, is that we are in a continental scale step, step. In this continental scale step, it will be, I think, rather important that we will be able to foster cooperation between the different countries that share the same culture a part of the same history, and most important, a part of the same values that we want to keep in the next decades. And be sure of one thing, nobody knows if these values will win or not, and they can lose. If we are doing nothing, they will lose for sure. Because our ideas of the liberal, I would say globalization culture that was, I would say, dominant in the last decades, will suffer very much in the next years to come. What has been done in Portugal, that was the message I should be conveying to you now. It is interesting to, 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 to say that Portugal is a, a, a country that is strongly connected to the sea. Okay, but anyhow, some years ago, we, were, we needed to do a plan to go back to the sea. 
how was it possible? We should be in the sea because we are a, a country of a people from uh, marine people. We are, we are the, some of the most important fishing communities every, everywhere in the world are, uh, were from Portugal, from the Azores in particular. So why is it possible that we needed a plan? We needed a plan for, because we forgot the sea, because we forgot that uh, the ocean was so important as it is. And that's why the plan was made. And that's why even with some changes in the governments, the plan is being kept with as much uh, strength as possible and that we are promoting and being strong on, the, on all initiatives that will be develop, developed in the next years. For example, the UN Decade of the Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, the, 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 the Agenda 20, 2030 for Sustainable de Development of the UN, and all the initiatives that were already described here. We are also very, very positive on the definition of a large area for, as a marine protected area, particularly in the North Atlantic. We are, we are, are trying to put together universities and institutes and, and the, the private sector moving on the same direction. We are trying to put assets together and to be able to be, I would say, a strong partners for all of you to the future of the ocean. The ocean is a very fragile system. Never forget that. It's not as re uh, resilient as we thought before. And uh, the biggest threat is climate change. It's clearly climate change. Climate change, we, make, we will make a different world very soon. Be aware that all the models are under-evaluating what we are measuring now. And that the different world will come still in our lives. And the, the biggest difference that exists between our present situation and what happened hundreds of years ago, it's easy to discuss. It's because we don't have time. Climate changed a lot. Civilization changed a lot. But the time for change was so long that there were several generations of people. Agriculture changed in all our landscapes, but it was the, the sons and the grandsons. Now there is no time. We are changing the life in the, in, the, in the time span of less than one generation. And that's why there is so much people afraid. Thank you. Everybody, uh, great to be here. Uh, very exciting. This is my first meeting. Uh, my name is Humrit Perkov Finko. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Econcrete. Uh, I come from Israel, from Tel Aviv. I'm a marine biologist and ecologist. I've been practicing uh, diving and researching in over 30 countries for the last 20 years or so. And uh, what uh, I develop in my company is a new type of concrete that you can build ports, you can build uh, marinas, you can build breakwaters and seawalls in a way that's much more sustainable and that can uh, provide habitat and a lot of value for marine life. So I'll start by explaining a little bit about the innovation very quickly. I have the sample here so you can envision it a little bit more easily. Uh, and then I'm going to zoom in on what I see as the challenges in our oceans um, taking on from those big issues of, of, of climate change and how women, uh, our communities, our coastal cities are actually adapting to those. Uh, so one of the problems uh, that I've witnessed is that concrete is being used very, very frequently in the marine environment. So when we are faced with sea level rise and extreme weather events, we're seeing more and more hardening of our coastlines, which take the physical place of beautiful, very diverse natural ecosystems like coral reefs, oyster beds, or kelps. And um, unfortunately, the blank concrete walls don't really accommodate a very rich and diverse habitat. And I started exploring how can we change that? How can we allow for a substrate that we so often use in such vast numbers and quantities, miles and miles of, of these structures are paving our coastlines. How can we actually utilize it as a substrate for healthier, richer, and more productive communities? So we started working on the concrete composition and we looked also at issues of roughness and three-dimensional design. And that's where we actually uh, created eConcrete. So eConcrete is a, 
uh, a new material design, a new solution for building in the marine environment when people absolutely decided that we have to build, and obviously my choice will be not to build and not to develop, but when we have to build, we should do it in a way that takes into consideration uh, the, ecology, the, the ecosystem, the marine life that's in there. And we can, we, we can actually study what are the species that are, are weak in those systems, which are the red flag species, and we can design for those species habitat needs. And to do that in a way that doesn't conflict with the structural operational needs of the system. So this is kind of a sample. This is how we would see a regular seawall, flat and featureless, from a regular Portland cement-based concrete, which is also the most uh, carbon-intensive material almost that we can build with. And this is what an e-concrete would look like, which is basically 10% um, uh, difference in the cement quantity of the concrete. Uh, so we created an admix that is almost entirely uh, byproducts from different industries. And when you put it instead of the Portland cement, we can get it to be more bioactive. So it actually grows a better biodiversity. Second level is the surface roughness and the, th the three-dimensional design. So really, we could add holes for specific fish that we want to have uh, colonizing our substrate. Um, we founded the company in 2012, and we've been developing it ever since in different countries, especially around the US, uh, Europe. Um, and one of the issues I wanted to raise is the, the fact that how difficult is it to bring innovation in this field? So everybody's talking about sustainable development goals. Uh, I'm taking on climate action and life below water. I'm taking on uh, innovation in construction and um, also coastal cities and, and rejuvenating their coastlines. So really our technology touches so many of the sustainable development goals in a very, very practical measure. And here I see a gap between people speaking about having to, to change, we bring a tool, and yet when we talk to people that need to implement it, usually there's a gap. There's no either no open-mindedness to new technologies in the concrete industry, in the construction industry, in the maritime industry. Uh, we find it very exciting sometimes to come with this new technology, but from that level to actual implementation, it's very, very difficult to integrate new technologies. And I think uh, some of the problem is awareness. So yes, we need to talk about, you know, we need to talk about in forums like this, that it is possible to, to make a difference within our, our, our generation, within our lifetime. The, there are technologies that are ready. Um, and so we need to raise awareness, but we also uh, need to come up with some supporting mechanisms to allow to assimilate these technologies, uh, including financial uh, incentives, including policies. Uh, not all countries have the same policies to allow for uh, more resilient, more adaptive coastal development. Uh, some are more advanced than others with uh, building with nature, with uh, greening the gray. I think a lot, of, a lot has been done in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, when we started the business, when we talked about ecological enhancement of coastal infrastructure, really nobody knew what we're talking about. And ever since, unfortunately, Sandy hit and a lot of other storms have hit, uh, large uh, uh, population centers and very uh, public ones, people have started to talk about building more resilient cities and coastlines. And so happily that we have technologies that are ready, ready to be implemented. Um, and we have a lot of people talk about sustainable development goals and how to better assimilate them and to go into concrete action. And we say, hey, we're ready. We're ha ready to implement, uh, but we need uh, open ears and we need uh, policies to change in, in a very practical way, in a very fast way, which I think is very difficult. And this is why I'm here to talk about it. And um, I'll be happy to uh, discuss this further over the lunch. Hi, sorry, I think we're gonna start with the next speakers now. Keep eating, those who are. Um, but anyway, so um, right now it's Paul Bucken, who is the seaweed guy. <laughs> He'll tell you anything you want to know about it. Thank you, Axel. I think we all in this room are, are concerned about the future uh, of the ocean. But let's take a step back. Let's go back billions of years. When this planet was, I think, did you all know it was all covered with CO2? It was like a soup of CO2 all over the, over the planet. But at that time, there was a small, like, blue-green algae in the ocean that sucked up the CO2 and puffed out oxygen in the sea and on the ocean, billions of years ago. And then millions of years, there become more and more oxygen in the sea and on land, and then it was possible to have life on this planet. 
And now we have a CO2 problem again. So maybe we have forgotten our friends, the guys in the ocean that helped sort this out billions of years ago. But there is a problem. These marine forests are disappearing all around the world at an alarming rate without most of us knowing. It's happening right in front of us here in Portugal, where the kelp forest, the brown seaweed, is almost gone. And so is much of the fish. And on all the continents, this is, this is uh, happening. But what's the, what's the importance of that? Well, you lose the function of the seaweed forest. So we know that it takes up CO2. It does so better, much more efficient than the rainforest even. But in addition, it also acts as a filter of the ocean. So all, everything from land eventually ends up in the sea. So we have runoffs from agriculture, pollution, everything goes in there. And the seaweed, the marine vegetation and seaweed forest cleans it. And at the same time, produce oxygen. And that was mentioned before today also. Acidification is a big problem. So it reduces acidification. And then, of course, maybe the most important benefit of this um, forest, which is ignored, is that seaweed equals more fish. There's few that make that direct link. But, but, uh, but fish, they hide in the seaweed forest. They spawn there, and they eat in those forests. So without forests, you don't have life. You, don't, you have less fish. Then you have other uh, benefits. You have increased biodiversity, which with the ecological crisis going on now, it's not only climate, it's also biodiversity crisis. This is a forest, this improves the biodiversity. And then you have coastal erosion, it's happening all over. Healthy, abundant seaweed forest will reduce coastal erosion. And of course you have uh, uh, economical benefits with this too. With fisheries you have more income, it's, it's more uh, money that way. But then tourism will benefit. And with abundant large forest, you can harvest a little bit sustainably. And that you can use for humans as food or medicine and so on. And you can use it for animals as feed. And you can use it for plants as fertilizer, like they've done in Portugal here for fertilizer, in Norway, other places too, on land. But then you might think, well, seaweed forest, this, this is probably not going to make a big impact on climate change or food supplies because this is a small guy just on the, on the beach, you see, it's not a huge area. So what is this? But then we asked ourselves that, that question, how, how big is that, we call it the blue front yard, that's, that's on all the continents, how big is it? And then if you imagine now that you lower the sea level down to 30 meters, that's the average depth of where you can find marine uh, vegetation. If you do that all over the world, what kind of area is emerging then? It was not easy to find that number, but that number is 15 million square kilometers. It is bigger than all the rainforests in the world. It is one and a half times the size of Europe, and we have forgotten that area. Maybe we should ask ourselves, actually, what are truly the lungs of, of uh, this planet. So, but we don't know about this, and why is that? It is simple, we don't see underwater. That's all the reason. We are not aware, we are so terrestrial in our way of thinking. We hear about forest fires, like here in Portugal, big forest fires, that gets our attention. But there are forest fires in the ocean too. There is rapid change in temperature, forests are gone, we don't do anything. So in Sea Forest, the organization I um, represent, well, before I say that, it is, the question is then, what should we do with this problem? Know that you guys at least know about it. Well, it's simple. We just have to plant the sea, just like we do on land. It is possible to plant seaweed trees in the ocean. It's not very difficult, dif different than techniques that you use on land. And that's what Sea Forester is about, the organization that we're a group of uh, business people and a different background and, and scientists, mostly Portugal and Norway now, that came together and we want Sea Forestation, it's on non-profit basis, we want these projects to pop up all over the world. 
as a global uh, campaign. And we got just now approved a project here in Portugal by the Portuguese uh, government. It's a project called Fundo Azul. It's a fund they have where we will start planting and testing seeding techniques in four locations in Portugal with four different types of seaweed uh, from uh, Viana in the north to Sagres in the south. So we hope that will be sort of the first step of getting the forgotten forest back on the Portuguese coast and the fish back and all the other benefits. And we also hope that this will be a global campaign that people can look at Portugal and, and we can sort of build it up for here to spread all over the world, on all the continents, to bring life back into the forgotten forest and, and, and the blue front yard. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Torsten Thiele, and I'm greatly inspired by the speakers we have just heard. This is indeed about a global vision, and so the organization I run is called Global Ocean Trust, because the vision for our planet needs to be about the ocean and the opportunity and about ocean solutions for all of us. The um, reason I focus in particular on ocean finances and governance is simply that I worked 20 years in finance and put projects together, and this space needs exactly that. So when I started looking at this ocean environment, I thought, okay, let's go to the finance world and bring this to the table here. But then I quickly realized that it's really a lot about finding deal flow, finding structures, finding great companies like you heard about earlier. Because until we break it down into these specific opportunities and processes, we can't have an investment profile that works, that brings this broader community the impact space into the ocean space. So this is key, and so that's why I now split my time between what I call ocean governance. So I've just arrived here from um, uh, the two weeks of negotiations we had at the United Nations around a new high seas biodiversity treaty. So you understand now why this is important. Most of our planet doesn't have a legal framework to actually do the types of assessments, the types of protection measures that nation states can do. For the high seas, this is not in place, but it is being negotiated. And so it is key that we bring this process to an end so that we have a structure for that. And the goal is to do this by 2020. We have a conceptual framework around the sustainable development goals that allow us to measure impact and deal with impact. And so Portugal is hosting the SDG 14 conference next June in Lisbon, and I think it is absolutely critical that, that at that point we present an ocean finance architecture that can actually support that implementation. We already heard about the decade of ocean science as this UNESCO-driven broad effort to bring the right science so that we know the scientific parts of the solution of that single ocean structure, and in particular, and this is an area I'm focusing on the data component of it. We can have an ocean data infrastructure that will give us actionable information, not just for the ocean, but predictive for what happens on land because of changes in the ocean. That is an investment that is perfectly doable and has economic benefits that far exceed the cost of that. What I find with the ocean science community is that they have some very interesting ideas around that, but from my point of view, almost a bit timid in terms of asking for what is necessary at the right scale. So we're working with UNESCO and um, the science community to put that at the type of scale where we have the sufficient amounts of granular ocean sensors in place so we know what these changes are and where we have the type of data platforms and the changes we see in the data world, the ability with satellites to monitor, to address the challenges that the minister from Namibia mentioned around illegal fishing, for instance. The economic benefits are massive and the investment is perfectly doable even in a private-public partnership approach. So we need to push that. And the third area that was mentioned is the decade for biodiversity. This is a massive challenge for us right now, and we need to address it in that marine context. So already at the Paris 
climate discussions. We've created an ocean action pathway. There's a whole group of organization working around that. We had a, um, since the actual Paris COP and then every COP thereafter, we're doing an ocean action day to familiarize all the climate community about the ocean component of all of that. So that's all of big stuff, but what really matters is the specifics, the local stuff. So uh, one project we recently launched is called Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. But what we found is the people who work on projects that really understand these local interactions and do all the good work, often the bankability is something where help is additionally needed. So we set up this as a facility that provides technical assistance. The first project we announced is in the Philippines. It helps um, areas where there are already efforts to create marine protected areas on coral reef sites and where we've started to find commercial ways to collect old fishing nets to get that marine plastic out of the system to add the seaweed component. You heard about seaweed. Seaweed is amazing. And seaweed is an ice cream. It's a real product. We can use it right now. But the local seaweed farmers, because of the changes in temperature, etc., need to be able to run their little seaweed packages in a more efficient way with the right types of seaweeds. And without things like styrofoam floaters that at the moment actually then get redistributed and create a whole new problem. So we've done that first uh, supporting structure. We are working with a whole range of um, emerging impact funds and other investing opportunities. But we need to build those financial mechanisms. But the amount of money we could presently deploy in the ocean is significant, but is actually in a global context not huge. So that amount of money is out there if we have that financial structure. So we need to promote those solutions from the large end. The, um, I call it an ocean sustainability bank, working with the multilateral lenders, making sure that their ocean awareness in all the infrastructure projects, you heard about how important it is that infrastructure procurement takes nature-based solutions into account, validates them, measures them appropriately. So all of that we need to bring in, that is a massive opportunity, a big change, and a big challenge because as you have seen, there are new financing vehicles that have come up in recent years. There's the, the Bridge and Belt Initiative. We need to make sure that those efforts are ocean and nature reliant, that they work with nature and not against it because if we build up the wrong kind of infrastructure across Africa and around the world, we ruin this opportunity of a lifetime to work with nature and, and finance. So I encourage you all to get engaged with the ocean space. I think it's the largest frontier market out there, space-wise for sure. Opportunity-wise, well, it all depends on all of us to work together on that. But it's the opportunity that we now have because the changes in technology and data, et cetera, and our emerging understanding of these complex marine ecosystems really create a, a unique opportunity for us to engage. So uh, please join us. And thanks for everyone here. OK. Um, thanks very much to all our speakers. Um, does anyone have any questions? I think now would be the best time. Um, as we gradually finish up, and we have one last speaker right, speaker right at the end. If you, yeah, go ahead, sir. Any of you want to answer that? I
that the answer is get the decade of ocean science to run, to look at how ocean science works in the biogeochemistry system. Anybody else? So, um, Dr. Hassan Hilal is the former, former Environment Minister of Sudan. Um, and please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I, uh, I started to write a paper, in fact, in this context, and uh, I found that it's only few minutes for discussions, but uh, I will buy some minutes from my previous colleagues who, yani, whose, uh, whose uh, uh, speech was being uh, reduced. So I started by saying that, uh, by, by thanking, in fact, Horaces, Horaces for this uh, very important invitation to me and to my advisor, Dr. Hisham Shazeli, who is here. And uh, it is the first time for me to visit Portugal. I found it very nice, very nice country. Uh, uh, in fact, when uh, I speak about oceans, oceans really create a larger carbon sink, a very large carbon sink, as a sink tank, and carbon sequestration, in fact, is very good, very high in oceans. And the economy is a term of uh, the blue economy. It is called the blue economy. Is in a term of, in, in economics relating to the exploitation and preservation of the marine environment. It, its scope of interpretation varies along organizations. Rivers can be considered in this regard. You can add rivers. Blue economy is considered to, combust, to encompass the marine use and conservation of the ocean seas, take rivers and other water resources. Historically, the blue, blue economy has been recognized as the great engine of growth and prosperity uh, in industrial relations. In fact, the green economy is very important. In Sudan, we have the Red Sea. The Red Sea, uh, our uh, boundaries in the Red Sea uh, are about 750 kilometers, which is very long. We have to make use of this uh, great wealth, this blue wealth. But uh, we have some customs in Sudan that people, um, people living near the the Red Sea, Red sea near, near the shore of the Red Sea, they don't have the, uh, the, they don't have the custom of eating fishes. They eat cows, camels. So, so uh, fish, fishes are sent to Khartoum, to Omdurman, to Jazeera, to big cities, other big cities of Sudan, away from the river shores. Uh, but now, Things have changed. They started to acquire such uh, a habit. Uh, Sudan, from previous decades, depends on green, green and blue economies. Although crop lands are increasing in Sudan, uh, cereals production increased. 60 million Fadans were cropped. More sorghum and so on, and wheat. More lands were added. So historically, uh, uh, and uh, horizontal, but not vertical. The, uh, in fact, this is a, a problem that the, the agriculture is growing horizontally, but not vertically. So, so most of the forest lands are lost due to this horizontal expansion of uh, agriculture in Sudan. For horizontal agriculture expansion, negative effects. 
more lands. In Sudan, we, we affect the blue economy uh, with the pollution or, uh, originated from industry. In general, oil industry, mining industry, and overfishing. So I think overfishing is always the same in most African countries. Uh, horizontal agricultural expansion, this is then countries including Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Mauritius, and so on, have already established the Minister of Finance, Trade, and so on, Blue Economy, are recognizing the need to diversify their economies. Now in Sudan, this, this is valid. Expanding fisheries, agriculture, tourism, transportation, and so on. Uh, this to, uh, to combat uh, poverty, to combat poverty. Uh, the strategic importance of the blue economy to trade is clear, not the international uh, maritime organization and specialized agency of the United Nations resp responsible for reg regulating shipping, for instance. Uh, for, for agrarian economy, Agriculture alone will not be sufficient to drive the economy since the sector is facing many challenges, including sh shrinking frame plants, past investation, past investitions, and unpredictable weather ch change. This is climate change problems. <coughs> Sudan is... Uh, uh, have what we call vulnerability and uh, changing situation. So we are very vulnerable to climate change. We suffer greatly from climate change. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we, we, we are now trying to introduce uh, solar energy to Sudan and uh, Sudan, as one of the biggest countries in Africa, total 1.8 million kilometers, it is in the heart of Africa, has main water resources, which includes Red Sea, rivers, seasonal water courses, in addition to ground water resources. The livelihood of the Sudan people depends on rivers and Red Sea agriculture, providing food as, as income. Uh, exploring the uh, blue economy. Uh, against this uh, backdrop, experts are urging African countries to, and Sudan to diversify and look beyond and based resources, um, beyond land-based resources by exploring the blue economy as it presents immense untapped potentials. The World Bank and the United Nations Development Program in their 2018 policy brief uh, make a strong case in favor of the blue economy. Ocean uh, renewable energy, tidal waves energy has the potential to meet up to 400% of the current global energy demand. Uh, in, uh, then I have uh, what we, we call coastal zone management and marine resources. This is very important. I will go through it. Uh, very uh, management plans for Signab. We have some uh, islands in the Red Sea. We are making use of that very greatly and very efficiently. And uh, then we uh, usually I say the temporal and spatial rainfall in Sudan is not as required. So sometimes you have shortage in crops and food. Uh, how to globalize solutions? How, what do we want uh, future economy to be? Uh, not cautions. None, nevertheless, environment 
experts have expressed concern that ongoing talks on the blue economy have largely revolved around full exploitation in order for countries to develop rapidly in the next 10 years and little on sustainability. They concentrate on exploitation and little on sustainability. This problem since that is evidence to show that ocean's resources are limited. Ocean resources are limited. For instance, explorers have presented evidence to show that at least 90% of the largest predatory fisher, fishes have disappeared from the West Oceans and Sudan. Uh, the, the, the blue world will only be a win-to-win, a win-win situation for Sudan. There are strategies in place to exploit and uh, protect. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of uh, uh, photos and diagrams, uh, but I have no projector here. We, we think that uh, we think that uh, we want to make an invitation for this forum to be in Sudan next year. So hopefully that, and hopefully that we can make a branch for forensics. Thank you very much. Right, that's, that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, I, ha I have this small thing that I like to do at the end of these things, which is just to sum up with one sentence. And my sentence this time is to help nature in the ocean help itself with concrete action. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>